This is episode 22 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. We took off last week, but we're now in the final push for the last four episodes. You can still support us through patreon.com slash sajjohnson. But at this point, I'd rather you review the book and share it with friends. That'd be the best repayment for all the time and effort. Thanks for listening. This podcast contains fleeting explicit language. Chapter 52, 3.5, Communication. Many animals are outstanding in some way. Cheetahs are fast, blue whales are large, musk oxen are cold hardy, and so on. Humans have the largest brain relative to body mass, a measure known as the encephalization quotient, or EQ. It's not our upright posture or opposable thumbs that sets us apart, it's our brain. The human EQ is 7.44, chimpanzee and ravens 2.49, elephant 1.87, dog 1.17, mouse 0.5. Note, Kinzer 2000, Roth and Dick 2005. End of note. This has a few side effects. As far as we know, humans have developed the world's most complex language system, and it's likely we're the only animals able to think about thinking, metacognition. Not that we would know if dolphins, with an EQ of 5.31, could do it. This ability to share knowledge with one another has allowed us to work together for millions of years. This teamwork, combined with our big brains, made up for our lack of claws, fangs, protective coverings, or speed over short distances, and allowed our ancestors to thrive. We experienced three communications revolutions throughout our more recent history. Humans became sedentary farmers 10,000 years ago, and trade routes moved goods and ideas around the ancient world. About 5,000 years later, knowledge and communications took a leap forward with the first writing systems. Writing and long-distance communications were only open to elites until the independent invention of the printing press in both China and Europe. In the West, this led to increased literacy and an explosion of thought as pamphlets and books spread ideas wider and quicker than ever before. The third revolution in communication has occurred in the last century, starting with telegraphs and radios and moving to television and the internet. The latter has put the sum of human knowledge in the pockets of 3.5 billion people, even though it is mostly used to watch videos and visit social media sites. About a third of bandwidth is pornography, another third is movies, shows, and clips, and a quarter of the bandwidth is for social media, a third of which goes to Facebook, meaning only a twelfth of the world's bandwidth is used for sharing all other information, as text-based traffic is light on resources. Note, Misra 2014. End of note. Instant global communication helps us avoid disasters, heal the sick, and share innovations. While it has proven beneficial for us as a global community, as with all technologies, we must ask ourselves what can be carried over into a future that is sustainable for many species, that is, a communication network that is not dependent on fossil fuels. First, we must consider how our communication infrastructure interacts with other species and the ecosystem. It is estimated that our telecommunications use 10% of the world's electricity, the majority of which powers the end-user's side. Note, Ethical Consumer 2014. End of note. Lithium batteries and other components are created in environmentally damaging ways. Analog printing relies on paper, which uses about 28% of the U.S.'s timber logged each year in one of the worst polluting industries. Note. Martin, 2011. End of note. None of this infrastructure could operate without the heavy use of fossil fuels. A newly built communication network is essential for sharing solutions communities have developed to sustain themselves into the future, but it cannot simply be the current system with solar panels. Although it would have to be powered by its small-scale energy generation, a global network may be built of nodes connected by radio waves instead of cables. Bandwidth would drop, and a future communication grid would be, by necessity, based on text and perhaps digital audio. Communities could create intranets to share digital media, as has been done in Greece, Washington State, and Cuba. Note, Andreoni, 2016. Bodkin, 2015. Watts, 2014. End of note. We need to continue to communicate without the support of deleterious industries and fuels. Part of building a robust communication system is long-lasting links and redundancy. Most components of a network should be repairable by a regular person, which would necessitate a retrofitting of existing computers and transmitters. Whenever possible, digital connections should be linked by more than one node in case one goes down for repairs. Alternative solutions for sharing information might involve physically transferring information through carried storage devices to leave any wireless networks more bandwidth. The library system could be revitalized and regain its place as a central shared resource of books as well as digital media. The more we can simplify our communication systems, the more likely we are to be able to maintain it in a world without fossil fuels. While many of us get enjoyment from resource-intensive communication networks today, we'll have to prioritize the information we send in the future, seeking the simplest methods to share information. End of chapter.
Chapter 53. Across the Distance. Summer, 2015. So what have you got for us, Eva? Eric was seated on a footstool in his living room. Every surface was occupied. We need a way to communicate that won't be easily compromised. Eva looked from face to face. We can't rely on phones, email, or anything else that's personalized to us. If somebody gets onto us, it's too easy to monitor messages sent to an individual, even when encrypted. Don't forget that the NSA started Tor, said Brett. And then they put it out there for hackers and other privacy-minded folks to use, thinking that they were browsing anonymously, only to be monitored through a back door. Exactly, Eva nodded. So we're going to be a needle hiding in a haystack. We're going to send coded messages through Craigslist posts. Won't that be obvious if someone sees a whole bunch of numbers or random words tacked onto an advertisement for a used air conditioner? asked Lauren. Yep, that's why we're going to hide our messages in pictures. You mean like a picture of a red light means stop? Eric looks unimpressed. Eva shook her head. Eric, what's a picture? Um, representation of visual... No, no, no. What's a digital picture? Ones and zeros, said Brett. Bingo! We're going to embed our coded text in the files that make up digital images. It's really easy. Even Jason could do it. Jason snorted. I was into cryptography when I was a kid. Everything can be broken. Well, given enough time, sure. But if they don't even see the code is there to begin with... What sort of code are we going to use? Substitution? Playfair? A one-time pad? asked Jason. A book cipher. And then scrambling and inserting dummy characters should give us plenty of cover. Jason nodded. Okay, but that's so boring. Why not let me come up with something better? Because everyone has to use it, so it has to be simple and robust. Um, what about translating that into English, please? said Eric. Jason turned to him. A book cipher uses an agreed-upon text where the page, line, and word numbers are given to indicate each word in the message. This alone is uncrackable unless the investigator knows which book is being used. And that's down to the specific edition. To make things more secure, Eva wants us to add extra characters and spaces that have no meaning to further confuse anyone looking at the code. How exactly would this work? asked Lauren. Okay, let's do a quick example. Eva opened her laptop. I'm pulling up the PDF version of the Monkey Wrench Gang. I figure this is appropriate for our work. Now let's say our plain text, that just means your message, added Jason, is something like, don't go to New York, keep low. Now, I search for those words in the PDF. It's much easier with a digital book. So I'm finding don't on page 14, line 30, word 2. And I write that down as 14, 30, 0, 2. Don't count blank rows between paragraphs or punctuation, of course, and stick to the first 99 pages. Now, for the rest of it, the clack of typing filled the air as the four looked over her shoulder. All right, so now we have seven words in book cipher reading 143002, 262814, 272011, 112907, 112908, 441506, 482712. We all know that every six numbers is a code, so we can just scramble the spaces like so. The numbers change on the screen. 1430, 02, 262, 81427, 201, 11, 12971, 129, 084, 415, 0648, 27, 12. And now we go to a random letter generator and plop down some letters in front of each segment. The code changed again. HH1430, WX02, AP262. IF81427, and so on. These last two steps are really not necessary, said Jason, because without the book, the first substitution is safe, but it makes the code look more complex than it is and can be easily stripped out for us to read. And they won't even see this unless they're looking for it, because we're going to hide it in a picture file. So let's use clunkers. We'll image search for an old car, download it, say call it carforsale.jpg. Now we put the cipher text in a text file of the same folder. Let's call it text.jpg text. Now, we simply run a quick command to add them together. Eva opened the Windows terminal and navigated to the folder with the files. She typed copy slash b car for sale dot jpeg plus text text old car for sale dot jpeg and hit enter. A new file named old car for sale dot jpeg popped up in the folder. And there we go. Now we just open this file with the text editor and you'll see our cipher text was added at the end of the file. Eric, you can do the same thing with cat in Linux. Great, but how do we find these pictures? We can post them in the auto sales listing on Craigslist. Let's just pick, I don't know, Chicago. We'll post something with the words deep and green in the text so we can search for them easily. Like for this car, I'd put something like for sale, best offer, terrible old car. It gets bad gas mileage and doesn't start well. It has deep scratches and the green paint is peeling. And then post this picture. What about words that aren't in the book, asked Eric. We can use substitute words. We'll have to work them out, but something like snake for pipeline, hawk for authorities, and so on. 
We should be vague in the codes, assume they're being read, and finally we should start each message with a short word starting with a vowel. That way, if one of us gets caught and forced to send a message, he or she can start the new message with a consonant initial word and alert us. Jason smirked at Eva. Did anyone ever tell you you're a huge nerd? Eva smirked back. Jealous? End of chapter. Chapter 54, Structures. As with all other infrastructure systems, transportation and communication networks, food and materials, our structures must conform to the principles laid out in this document if humans stand a chance of transitioning to a livable future instead of continuing on our crash course. Global construction accounts for about a quarter of annual emissions, and, once built, structures consume another third of the energy pie in the United States. Note, Huang et al. 2018, United States Green Building Council, no date, end of note. Greenhouse emissions are usually driven by the burning of fossil fuels, so they are a shorthand to indicate where major changes will have to come in the near future. We must learn to build, maintain, and heat structures in novel ways, perhaps borrowing from historical and vernacular architecture as well as developing new ideas. Right now, recreate buildings we want and change the landscape around them to fit the requirements of that building. Long electric, gas, water, and sewer lines are installed, and tons of concrete, wood, asphalt, shingles, and other components are shipped in from all across the world. Every component of the construction and operation of the building is made possible by fossil fuels. Case in point is the reason that most people insulate their houses, to cut down on heating costs, rather than to reduce the need for energy consumption. The first step towards recognizing that we, and the structures we build, are part of a larger world is designing and retrofitting structures as living buildings, a rubric of design imperatives that forces us to consider a building's impact on its surroundings. Instead of designing the building we want and plopping it down on the landscape, the ecosystem should be the starting point. What are the local water resources, both availability of fresh water and the absorption of so-called waste water? What building materials are on site or nearby? In what ways can we build to take advantage of existing heating and cooling mechanisms such as sunshine in the Earth's below-ground constant temperature? How will this building displace some species and provide habitat for others? Animals living in cold regions have a variety of strategies for dealing with winter temperatures, all of which can provide ideas for reducing the need to heat our homes. The most obvious adaptation is thick fur and layers of fat. In short, insulation. And not only that, usable and variable insulation as fur can be shed and fat metabolized as the season dictates. Current buildings prize large picture windows with difficult to insulate spaces because of current abundance of fossil fuels being able to compensate for poor design. When instead, we should be creating appropriately insulated spaces using abundant natural materials like straw and sun-oriented construction to add heat in the winter and shade in the summer. In current buildings, function follows form, and the critical question asked by architects is, how can we build this, instead of, what is the simplest way to meet our needs? Average house sizes have almost doubled in the last 40 years. Note, Perry, 2016, end of note. In that same time, residential energy use has dropped slightly, but the savings could have been doubled by keeping the house size steady. Note, from 114 million BTUs in 1980 to 90 million in 2009, US EIA, 2012. End of note. As we shift away from fossil fuel dependent construction, large houses will become less attractive to build, heat, and maintain. Instead of tearing down existing energy intensive infrastructure, however, in most cases it is more effective to revitalize structures with energy conserving retrofits an exterior layer of straw bale insulation clad in reused siding, solar water heating, underground heat exchanges built on south facing greenhouse enclosures, and dividing over large homes into multifamily units. Water, so-called waste, and other systems can be converted to source and repurpose resources on site. Retrofitting is simpler than building new structures, and we might as well use the advantages brought about by the previous century's use of fossil fuels to create structures that will last into the next era. End of chapter. Chapter 55. Neighborhood Stockpiles. Summer 2016. It was the fall after Rosie had taken charge of Tower Grove's Citizens Resilience chapter, and all over the neighborhood, lots had been turned over into gardens. Some landlords had protested, but the police were too busy to deal with people gardening in empty lots. The mayor and town council had declined to take any action, saying that they wanted time to study the issue, and as gardening was no danger to the property, they were in no rush. One landlord tried to take Citizens Resilience to court, but the judge had said that he had no case against the organization because it was the residents doing it. The organization gave them no specific directions. When the landlord tried to sue the residents, the judge asked him to enumerate the damages he suffered by people gardening on a plot that he had held empty for five years with no plans filed with the city for construction. 
When the landlord couldn't demonstrate any economic damages, the judge dismissed the case. The defendants filed a counterclaim against him for attorney's fees. In the meantime, Lauren had met with residents of the landlord and filed a class action suit against him for loss of peaceful enjoyment and failure to provide habitable property. They asked for the conditions of their units to be improved, rent to be held stable for a five-year period, and empty lots to be given to the community as compensation for their years of living in substandard housing. Rosie stood in the middle of one of the gardens, watching neighbors at work on their plots. The front half of each lot was given in order of free food. As part of their rent, each gardener was asked to help tend part of the garden that would be available for anyone to harvest. Not everyone was physically able to garden, and this provided fresh vegetables without the bureaucratic hurdles of food stamps. Rosie watched as an old man directed a little boy in picking out ripe tomatoes and okra. Behind her, a half dozen people stooped over their raised beds, plucking weeds, harvesting greens, and removing the slugs that had just come out in the early evening. Some of the gardeners were African Americans, like her, but plenty of the plots had bright red Thai peppers that nearly every South Asian gardener grew. Young white neighbors had also taken plots in the garden. Long-term residents of the neighborhood had been ambivalent about the growing number of people moving in and gentrifying the area, resulting in raised rents and displaced friends and family. At the garden, though, many of the new neighbors were learning the gardening practices from a group of ancient-looking women whom Rosie remembered as old when she was a little girl. Bent at the waist, one woman leaned on a cane, telling a young man with a beard how to prune his tomato plant, and when he was done, he might as well keep going on hers. Rosie was impressed by the diversity of growing know-how that was shared between gardeners, both informally and at weekly classes taught by volunteers. Those who were just learning also contributed by helping maintain the walkways, fences, and other infrastructure of the garden. Instead of having to ask people to clean up or take care of problems, she was bombarded by people asking what else they could do. She was excited about her neighborhood's chances in the upcoming Resilient Neighborhoods Challenge and thought they stood a good chance of winning one of the development prizes. End of chapter. End of part three. End of episode 22 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.